Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Eric Kedorov. I'm tech investment banker and founder of Private Tech Network. We are a network of tech founders and also tech investors. And I get the opportunity to speak to a lot of interesting startup founders who have convictions and views of the future trends. So today we're lucky to have Michael Rugert, who is founder and CEO of Tokenizer, which is a data and media platform. It's a global platform that enables tokenization industry. Hello, Michael. Hello, Eric. Uh, thanks for, for having me. Uh, good to talk to you today. Yes, it's great to have you, and we really appreciate you sharing uh, sharing the views. So, Michael, you're based in Copenhagen, which is a well-known uh, kind of hub for tech startups and fintech startups. Tell a little bit about yourself and your evolution to start Tokenizer, and why did you start Tokenizer? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to. But actually, first of all, I, I, I if if anybody sees this, uh, I, I would like to say that. Eric, I have known you now for around six months, I think, and we have started to, to work pretty closely together. And I just want to say to people that uh, I'm deeply impressed by the way you handle the situation that you are in now in Kiev with the war and everything going on. Uh, I'm, uh, whenever I, I have some problems on my own here with the, the company and how to do everything, I, th I think of you, Eric, and oh. uh, I think, okay, if, if, if he can do it in that brilliant way and be so brave and so strong, the rest of us have no reason to, to, uh, to uh, be Oh, Michael, sad thanks or, for good uh, words, but the position here, you know, things are tough, but every war is over and life goes yeah. on and we need to think about the future <laughs> and how we yeah, shape absolutely. the future. So that's... Okay, not but, us, but uh, indeed, we look forward to yeah, end, all, end of the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I just want to see it's a pleasure working with you. Uh, Thank you. And it's Thank a you. pleasure being here today. But okay, uh, my name is uh, yeah, my name is Michael, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of uh, the Tokenizer. Uh, we are headquartered, as you said, in uh, in uh, in right in the middle of uh, Copenhagen, um, and. Uh, my own background is uh, certainly not from uh, uh, tokenization or, or anything like that. Uh, I have a master's degree from uh, uh, the University of Copenhagen, but in, uh, in literature and in uh, communications and in uh, uh, Nordic language, uh, languages. So, um, so that's actually my, uh, my background. Um, after... I finished university. I started working in uh, in the PR industry and in uh, journalism. So uh, I have many many years of uh, experience within uh, basically writing any anything you can you can think of. And um, and I've been publishing all kind of uh, things over the years. And uh, I've been editing different uh, kind of magazines and starting magazines and uh, published books and so on. And actually, because I knew that you would ask, I, I just went to my bookshelf, which is just uh, down here, and, and just took what, what I could find just uh, just really fast. And these, these are just some of the... Oh, these are your books, right? Wow. One well, of the publications from over the years. So... Um, but there's a there's there's a lot more we have, we have made or I have written together with my my people lots of uh, white papers and and stuff like uh, like that also. Um, before I started my own company, I was um, as I said in the PR industry. Uh, at a at a certain point, uh, I wanted to make my own agency, so I did that together with with two colleagues here in, uh, in Copenhagen. Um, and while we were doing that, we published uh, this uh, this book also. And it's a, it's a Danish book, but the title would be in English, uh, When the Internet Changes the World. And this is back in, uh, in 2001, actually. So, um, 
Yeah, so a lot of uh, experience in uh, also with tech, of course, uh, and um, uh, with clients like uh, IBM and uh, big IBM, big uh, technology uh, clients as an account director on different uh, agencies. Um, and then I came to, then, then I wanted to move into a big company to see how that uh, worked. And, uh, and I became a press manager and a press spokesperson in the biggest uh, Nordic payment company called Nets. Um, and I was especially dedicated to whenever they had a crisis, uh, you know, at the time and, and still now, Nets was responsible for the Danish national debit card called Dankart, which all Danes used uh, at these days and these years. So, and for the national uh, ID solution as well, called uh, NEMID. And whenever these uh, technical problems or if, whenever these systems had technical problems and downtime, down, downtime uh, up to 20, 30, perhaps 40 journalists from newspapers, radio and TV and everything called into my number or one of my two colleagues' numbers who were uh, kind of the first line of uh, defense. Um, so that was pretty educational, you, you could say, but um, pretty stressful as well. Um, eventually, I got tired of that and uh, decided to start my own, own company. And I con convinced one of my very good and bright uh, colleagues at NETS, a guy called Christian, to, uh, to join me. And the idea at the time was to, to start a communication PR and consultancy business focusing solely on fintech, which was uh, yeah, new at the time. And we started that in uh, 2016. Uh, and there were no other agencies, at least not in the Nordics, uh, with uh, that particular uh, focus. And what we were especially interested in was payments and regulation and, uh, and blockchain. And blockchain was, uh, yes, yeah, of course, you know it, uh, still pretty new at the time. And, um, and I, I, I wrote the first Danish longer um, report about... Um, blockchain at that time i think it was in in january 2016 and it was done together with computer world in denmark um the magazine and uh, and then we started uh, this new company and uh, after some years um we got this um, we got this idea and uh, and started the tokenizer the tokenizer was a side project uh, from the beginning. Please uh, interrupt, Eric. I mean, I can keep uh, talking for, for hours. Um, Michael, but... maybe you mentioned, uh, obviously, some people may be familiar with tokens. And if you think about uh, things like casino chips, right, this is a token, or maybe like airline coupon. This is conventional yeah. users, but maybe for general public, you describe what the token is and what are the types of tokens and why do you believe Tokens is something big. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe just just to just to start from the beginning, and I I will try to do it uh, briefly. Um, but the reason why we got into this area of asset tokenization and security tokens, and by the way, yeah, well, a token is a digital representation of some kind of asset. It could be anything from a uh, from a. a, a a bond to a forest or a painting or a building or uh, gold or diamonds or whatever. It's a digital representation of an asset um, on a blockchain in the form of a token, which is basically a piece of computer code. Uh, and um, typically is controlled by uh, some kind of smart contract. Uh, which is a, a self-executing uh, contract, a uh, computer code as well. So, um, and this representation of something that is a real asset, um, that is backed by something real, is is uh, different if you compare 
uh, this part of the the, um, uh, the token industry with uh, the crypto part uh, part with the traditional cryptocurrencies uh, and so on. Uh, and of course, we have started to be interested in in this what I call the traditional part already at that time. But um, we were approached by approached by um, some of the guys from MakerDAO that you probably know, the company behind the stablecoin uh, DAI. Uh, and actually their CEO and founder, Rune Christensen, who is a Dane as well and lives in Copenhagen. He came to, uh, to our office and knocked on, uh, at the door and uh, together with one of his uh, guys, one of his um, colleagues and uh, asked, asked us if we could help them with some um, different tasks uh, about strategy and uh, communication and some content that they wanted us to, uh, to make for them. And we had a fantastic meeting with this brilliant, brilliant guy, uh, Rune. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that they wanted us to do was to, to write a report um, about real world asset tokenization. And that was in uh, 2018, I think. And I didn't know anything about um, uh, these kind of uh, tokenization at the time. I knew about payment tokenization from NETS, but not when it, uh, not, not this type of this um, interpretation of uh, tokenization and what it is and what it uh, can do. Uh, and I started writing this um, this white paper or this uh, report. Uh, and while I was doing so, I, I got the idea that um, we should we should make a platform. Um, we should uh, build something that could help bridge the gap between the inner circles of uh, blockchain, you know, the blockchain and token communi community. Uh, and the outside world, the capital and the investment markets, uh, the financial industry, and this huge landscape of private owned companies and projects that uh, eventually would be uh, uh, the real target groups for asset tokenization. Um, so, so what I uh, saw there, what I started thinking a lot about was that uh, as I so the, there was a huge, huge need for uh, education, communication, explanations, uh, and um, trying to build this bridge to, to open up this, uh, this uh, new thing about asset tokenization. Because in the inner circles of blockchain, everybody agreed that this was, uh, this was, this was a revolution and it would become massive and uh, really, really important in, in so many ways uh, in the coming years. But the problem is, because this is uh, it's pretty technical, heavy, it's complex, it's not uh, necessarily that, that easy to understand what all, all about, all this about tokens and different kind of tokens and different kind of standards and whatnot is. So you really need somebody to explain it and to help you understand if this revolution ever should um, have any impact at all. Yeah, speaking so about revolution mm -hmm. and impact, uh, I track fintech companies and obviously there is a lot of change across fintech, things like yeah. retail banks, insurances. There are probably more than 2000 companies that we track. Right, and this is okay. more consumer retail finance. And now, do you think it will also impact in a big way Main Street finance, including things like equity markets, stocks and bonds, including you know the way funds raise uh, money from LP, like venture capital, etc. What is your view on the impact on kind of mainstream, you know, classical finance? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually. I've, I've started, or I've thought of this in, in many different ways, and, and uh, there's no doubt there's a, a, a massive potential. And just ask all the big, um, uh, the, the big investments, investment banks, 
uh, ask McKinsey, ask uh, uh, Boston Consulting and whatever. They, they all agree on this. And by the way, Boston Consulting Group, uh, as you probably know, and a lot of people know now these days, made this estimate made of the, of the, um, the value of this uh, market or how big a deal this actually is and said that at 2030, we are talking about at least uh, $17 trillion and it could actually, in the best case, go up to $68 trillion. So we are talking about pretty big numbers here. And it's a huge change from zero going to many trillions in the matter of you know five years. Yeah, and okay, maybe maybe it will be let's let's add five years more then, but still, well, it's it's still a lot. You know, take good things takes time, but uh, but we have seen the market the the market has started to accelerate, and I think in ten years when we look back at this time and this. Uh, emerging market as, to as tokenization is right now, we will, we will probably think that, wow, that went really, really fast. But when you are a player in, in the game and uh, you do this every day and look at this market every day, you tend to think that, oh my God, nothing is, is happening. It's, it's, it hasn't moved one centimeter from last week. But if you, if you look from a higher perspective, it really, really moves uh, fast, and we can see that. But to answer your question, um, I have started to think of a way of dividing, and it's very, uh, it's it's very simple, I know, but uh, just to to get some kind of understanding, uh, to divide the market into two main parts, and the first is um, what you could call. Uh, a different kind of financial instruments which are already digitized, probably already uh, liquid, but not tokenized. And that would be things like shares and bonds uh, as uh, obvious examples. So why would you ever tokenize anything like that? Uh, well, to find the reason for that, you need to, to look into the way things are traded um how uh, how many uh, different different um, um, uh, intermediates you have when you uh, when you when you make these uh, trades you you have to look uh, in in uh, in post trading um, processes and things like that and um, I think most experts now agree that, it would probably be very likely that you can uh, uh, increase efficiency, increase automation, uh, that tokenize, uh, tokenization can uh, streamline some of these uh, trading process and uh, automate uh, compliance due to smart contracts and, uh, and also reduce settlement times if you're interested uh, in that and uh, probably take out some, uh, some middlemen in this, uh, this process. Um, and I don't remember the name of the guy right now, but um, the former uh, CEO of, uh, of, of NASDAQ said a couple of years ago that, uh, I, I won't dare to quote him, but the, the, the point is that in, I think he said 10 years or something, Actually, uh, NASDAQ launched a tokenization exchange, uh, like a subdivision called NASDAQ Link, which I think is a pilot project, but it shows the mainstream exchanges uh, closely looking yeah. at tokenization. Yeah. Well, what he said was that all, uh, all um, shares could be tokenized and they will be tokenized within this uh, time frame. So, so, so that's the, the, the main part, uh, or that's, that's one of the parts of this uh, market. Um, and here we're talking about investment banks and banks in general, uh, and uh, big issuers of uh, bonds as, as well. Uh, but also, also more traditional banks, they have to think about what they can do and which role they will be able to 
to take in this uh, in this new industry. And uh, and one thing is that um, uh, we'll we'll need uh, we'll need custodians uh, and we'll need custodians that we really trust and really smart custodians as well. And uh, I think there's certainly uh, a, a role here that uh, uh, that banks should look into, into because that should be, uh, I mean, one of the things that they're good at and they should be able to play, play a role in the token economy as well. Another thing is to get more knowledge and more understanding so that you'll be able to advise your clients I mean, if a if a bank client come to a traditional bank today and say, "Okay, uh, could you please could you please uh, tell me what what kind of security tokens you think I should invest in?" I'm pretty sure at least no Danish bankers would be able to give any answer whatsoever to that. But why not, actually? You mentioned so, many advantages of tokenization like mm -hmm. low intermediaries, you know, settlement and clearance time, cost of transaction, okay. uh, liquidity. I think uh, somebody can yeah. have well, like fractional ownership. There is exactly. transparency yeah. across value chain. But then on yeah. the other hand, there are challenges to adoption. Obviously, regulation is one because each country has their own legal framework. Then yeah. technological challenges like blockchain security and custody. I think you Absolutely. have finished like knowledge and education. What, yeah. in your opinion, are the main challenges for to adopt tokenization? Obviously, you help in the transition. Yeah, well, I, I have to say, and I, I mean it as well, but there's, there are more, more challenges. But one of the challenges is certainly uh, regulation. Um, and, and, uh, and let me say a little bit about this, because when, when, when I uh, I got the idea for, for this, uh, for the tokenizer, right? Uh, and or at the same time, because I had been looking into this for quite a long time, it, uh, it became very obvious also that because we are talking about actual uh, securities here, I mean, security tokens uh, will be deemed securities in, uh, in most jurisdictions. Um, and uh, because we are talking about that, there's you you, are, you have to be compliant with the regulation. Uh, it's not an option. Yeah, you can't choose not to be. I mean, well, try to do it, and you, you will end up in jail. So you have to follow the rules. You have to be compliant. And uh, and what I start to think of uh, about at that time was that wow, this is a huge challenge because if you want to, let's say you want to tokenize. Uh, your company tokenizes shares in your company in a security token offering, which is um, it's not exactly like an IPO, but it's a, a kind of in this in this uh, in this space. Uh, so you you issue some tokens. They are security tokens, which means they are securities, and you want to sell them on the, the market, sell them to investors. It's very likely that you don't just want to sell them. In your own country, because why should you? I mean, this is a global industry. It's possible in tokenization to sell to, uh, 24 hours a day, uh, and you can sell on or trade on different uh, exchanges around the world. So why only choose one jurisdiction? If I I'm 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 here in Denmark. If I want to tokenize a tokenizer, by the way, which I actually want to do at some point. Um, I would I would want to sell our trade our um, sell our tokens in as many jurisdictions around the world as possible. Of course, to reach as many investors as possible. The the challenge here is that I can I can go to the Danish FSA and have a talk with their lawyers and we can agree on what how uh, what I need to do, what the requirements are, and. Um, how I'll be compliant in uh, in Denmark, but it doesn't help me that much if I want to to sell to uh, investors in Southeast Asia, or in the Middle East, or in the US, or in the rest of Europe. Even 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 though we are an, 
uh, a part of the EU. Um, when you're talking about security tokens, uh, you have to uh, you have to follow what's called uh, the MIFI 2. And MIFI 2 is a EU uh, directive. It's not a regulation, it's a directive. And what that means is that every European country uh, have their own interpretation. That's, that's part of the, that's what a directive means in this, in, in this sense. So uh, it's not even the same from European country to European country. So to, to get a complete overview of this, the regulation of this area uh, across jurisdictions around the world is a pretty big challenge. And that's why we got the idea of making some kind of uh, tool that could basically, at least when the, new, when, when the next edition comes to, uh, to the market, I'm sure we'll be much closer to that, to have a really real time um, scanning of what's going on in jurisdictions around the world. It's called our, our solution, our service, our product, whatever you want to call it, it's called the token regulator. Because I imagine this is a radar that was uh, scanning the globe, uh, and we are collecting data from uh, around the world. What's happening in each uh, jurisdiction in this particular area of asset tokenization and security tokens, and we are putting it into a big database, and um, and you can subscribe uh, subscribe to that, uh, and there's a, a certain number of uh, services added to it. And as you know very well, Eric, because I've been talking with you a lot about that, the next version of the token regulator uh, should have a, an AI layer integrated into it, which will make this the most beautiful tool that I can... Yeah. As a founder, Michael, I definitely don't want to speak to lawyers in 80 countries and spend... My <laughs> no, exactly. I don't have time for that. <laughs> and this is where... No, I mean, uh, so maybe you maybe you also don't have money for that because yes, that's maybe not enough what? money. But yeah, maybe maybe. my question is, you know, with tokens and regulations, uh, the whole landscape is extremely, extremely complex. You know, we're talking about yeah. multiple token times types, yeah. right? Equity tokens like NFTs, uh, stable coins, you know, asset backed tokens, etc. Uh, like yeah. regulations are very complex because like you said, every country has its own regulation. And then yeah. if you look at exchanges and service providers, right, there are multiple and multiple exchanges and exchanges. decentralized yeah. exchanges, etc. So the question is, how do you keep track of all that? And obviously data and information collection becomes a centerpiece. This is where you yeah. guys come into play. So can you maybe uh, speak a little bit about your data platform and the functions that tokenizer provides. Yeah, the the, the tokenizer has uh, a number of uh, of different services. Uh, I mean, I mentioned the the token regulator as well, and um, and what we are doing there is that we we have a, a huge network, and they help us to um, to collect data, and some of it we do manually, and we keep track of. Uh, a lot of uh, very important um, uh, websites and uh, different sources where we know that uh, we need to to look to 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 get all the data. Uh, so there's there's different ways to to do this. But besides uh, the token regulator, uh, the tokenizer is. In its core also, or the way it started, it was uh, primarily um, a, a data and news uh, platform, and it still is, uh, and we have around 7,000 uh, unique visitors every day that goes into the, not to the regulator, but, but to the tokenizer, the tokenizer.io to look for uh, news about uh, news and information about this uh, new industry and uh, our visitors come from all over the world. We do have some from Denmark, but uh, Denmark is really not interesting here at all. We Most of them come from the US and from Asia and from the Middle East and from the rest of uh, Europe. 
So it's truly, truly uh, global and, uh, and actually from um, South America as well. Um, and, uh, but, but the media platform has um, certain functions for us. Uh, it's part of the, our, our mission, uh, as I talked about this idea of bridging and educating and informing or give information to people, but it's also an idea, a launch pad for, for our own services, as you can imagine. Think about it, if every, every, every company that wants to launch a new product has their own media platform. I mean, that's what we have here. Mm. And we, we are now, we have spent the last uh, two years trying to uh, come up with uh, ideas for, for, for new services and uh, products. Recreator was uh, the first, the SaaS product, the first one. But also, uh, we have something we call the, the, the Red Chick Service Suite, which is uh, partly consultancy uh, with some kind of uh, automation also. And we have what we call the SEO uh, Guidance Service, which is primarily consultancy as well. Because consultancy is uh, important also for the tokenizer, and we want to build up uh, as a strong uh, consultancy business as part of our platform. And actually, uh, what we see now is that we start to get requests from um, asset owners that have it, it could be it could be any basically any kind of uh, uh, any kind of asset. It could be a commodity, uh, commodities. It could be uh, whatever uh, uh, real estate or or forest or whatever. And we start to get requests from people who want to want us to to help them understand the process, plan for a, a project which could be a, a security token offering eventually, or uh, at least they want to look into how and why to tokenize an asset, what are the benefits, what are the options, what are the, what, what, what are the challenges, what are the costs, and so on. Mm. Um, and, and that's really, really good, good for me to see, for us to see that the, the market is, has started to accelerate. And we, well, there's a long way to go, Eric. We are definitely not, <laughs> not there yet. And they, our products and services are brand new, and they still have to really find their, uh, find their, how to say it, um, their their, uh, their ultimate uh, market fit. But uh, but we are working on these things, and uh, yeah, and it's a, it's a fantastic journey. Sorry, I for, I forgot your question. Yeah, uh, Michael. On the regulation side, as you scan all the regulations, which countries are the most uh, friendly, you know, for token regulations? And do you think the legal frameworks they lack behind the technology, in a sense? Yeah, it always it always does, uh, and and that's that's just the way it is because uh, startups around the world come up with brilliant ideas and they develop something. And then uh, they send it to the market, perhaps, probably. And then the regula regulators start looking into it and see, hey, AI is a brilliant example, right? Uh, now, the, for instance, the EU start to look very closely into to the AI space to see what we can do to regulate it, um, because we probably have to. Uh, and, and so, so technology is almost always in front here. And that's only natural. Uh, uh, and that's the way it is. If you look at uh, countries, there's a number of countries that, uh, for historical reasons, has been uh, more friendly than, uh, than, than other countries. Some of them are, just from the top of my head, um, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong to some degree, but also some uh, European countries like uh, uh, Liechtenstein certainly, Switzerland, Austria certainly, um, Germany also uh, now. So and uh, and and, and the, I should mention more, but they these are some of the uh, the, the friendly countries. Uh, Denmark is not a good example, uh, actually. Oh, I, I'm still not. waiting for. No, it's not. And uh, there's a there's a 
the reason for that is that we we used to be, or in many ways, Denmark has been in in front in terms of uh, digitization for many years. For instance, in in payments and in the IT solutions and and things like that. So everything is going pretty well in Denmark, and there's there's a lack of a burning platform and has been until until now. Uh, but if you look in to to other places in the world. Uh, they are very, very keen in finding out in finding out how to utilize these new options of uh, blockchain and tokens, because there's a need for it. In Denmark, we we tend to think that, come on, we are in front, have been forever, and this is, but of course that's not the case. Uh, and eventually, will um, Denmark and the Nordics will accelerate as well, but they are not there yet. So, but but well. Some of our, some of us are interested very much in this, <laughs> although we are Danes. Michael, so, I would like to thank you for sharing your thoughts. And I don't know if you're lucky or unlucky to live in the time of really rapid change, but uh, <laughs> would like to wish you good luck in developing tokenizer into global data and media platform in tokenization. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you.